welcome to this amazing panel. Uh, we want to jump right in and have this discussion. Uh, May 25th marked one year since the death of George Floyd. And so I just want to open up the panel by having them tell me a little bit about themselves, but see, uh, as we ask two very specific questions, how far have we come and where do we go from here? But talk about what has happened over that last year. Have we seen transformative change? What are the, some of the things that we need to do? I just want a 50,000 foot view as we introduce ourselves uh, to the viewers and listeners today. And I'm gonna start with you, Jerry. Well, thank you, Bakari. Uh, Jerry DeVard, I am a CMO marketer, uh, founder of the Black Executive CMO Alliance, which was really created to kind of take advantage of the opportunity to create and present more African-Americans that are sitting at the top of the houses and marketing and some amazing companies. I really got tired of the issue and conversation being around uh, supply when really it's about demand. And when you look at the fact that only 3% of chief marketing officers are black and it's been that way for three years, I said enough's enough. How do we pay it forward? How do we pay it back? So that more young black marketing professionals can become chief marketing officers and by giving them the playbook. But this is how you overcome adversity understand and know that the rules are stacked against you, that you don't start at the same playing field, all the things we know, but being able to see and understand that they have what they need in order to succeed. And all they have to do is really reach within themselves and understand that you can overcome. Even if you trip, you're gonna get back up and you can overcome adversity because we all have, but sometimes you think you have to be perfect. When you ask that question about, you know, what's happened over the past year, and it's a great question, because in some ways there's been a lot of progress. And, and I say that and I'm ready for panelists to disagree with me, but I think we'd all agree that it's not enough. It's never enough. And based upon whatever you read, whatever statistics you've seen, there's been upwards of $60 billion that has been pledged by companies and CEOs about creating change. And the question becomes, who's tracking that? What's the transparency that companies have when you see this is what I've spent? I think we've made progress, though, in terms of things like these diversity audits that people are doing, where you actually can talk about the representation. Because before last year, that was kind of a secret, and people weren't held accountable for that. So I think there's been progress in that. I also think that the progress has been in the conversation that we're now having conversations that before no one wanted to talk about or more arrogantly people felt that we'd done enough. CEOs felt that they'd done enough. You weren't talking about the consequences of not having done enough. So I, in that regard, I think we've had progress, but there's a lot more to do. That's a great segue. Um, and I wanna talk about the C-suite and some of those things that you've seen from the corporate America perch, there's no better uh, way to get to that than individuals who are actually there. So uh, I want to go with, with Charles and, and Ms. John. Let's let's lay it out. You guys see it every single day from your perch. Talk about the last year. She mentioned that $60 billion. I think the money's all good, but I also am someone who says that if you don't change your corporate culture, if you're just talking about the illusion of inclusion, what does it really mean? So am I looking at this from the right perspective? And, and how do we how do we hold these individuals accountable? So I could take that, Bakari, I could start, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. So Tara John, I'm Vice President of Talent Management at Manulink. So I'm accountable for assessments, talent review, and leadership development for the organization. And I think if I, building on what uh, you've said and what we've heard previously, well, some of the things that we're finding is what has happened in the past year is that organizations start to look, do some self-reflection and think about what have they said publicly with respect to DEI. And a lot of the work that they're doing focused on one segment. And a lot of that, that, the primary focus on that was for gender. And when you look at some of the work that was happening, it didn't touch intersectionality. And so we weren't seeing the impact of black women. We weren't seeing the impact of women of color. We weren't seeing the impact uh, on women with disabilities. It was primarily white women that were benefiting from some of the work that was happening. And so as we started to, as organizations were responding and being really declarative about commitments that they're making, they're realizing it has to be an and. It can't just be one group at the expense of another. And I think some of, when we realize what was happening, it's it, we're realizing it's taking much more time to actually get there. It is gonna be a journey. There's a lot of work that needs to happen. The journey is not gonna be linear, but we're having more robust conversations right now. We're also seeing CEOs, and I could talk about this from a manual life perspective, 
our CEOs are, are sitting at the are sitting at the table and holding accountability for DEI. They're co-sponsoring, just like Roy Gore is at Manulife, co-sponsoring DEI councils. And so they're at the table, not just discounting this, not just passing it on to HR or to the DEI team to lead. They're, they need to be held accountable for driving these business results like it's any other business uh, mechanism that they're tracking. Charles, I mean, from your perch, you have a unique um, role because you kind of see how the, the you, you also intersect with the public policy space as well at the BEA, but you come from a, a great uh, corporate background as, as well. Over the last year, what are some of the changes that you've seen? If we were to say, how far have we come? How would you answer that question from a corporate perch? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I've been a technology executive most of my career, uh, president of Oracle, CEO of M4. And, uh, and I'm on the board of American Express and Viacom CBS, so I kind of see different uh, touch points. And it's been remarkable over the last year, kind of the change in the dialogue. So I would, I would say before George Floyd, it was something of a checkbox that you had to at least acknowledge, but you didn't spend a lot of time on for most CEOs. And what's changed now, I give the credit to employees. Employees put the pressures on their CEOs, especially in tech where you need those employees, they're hard to replace. And they want purpose and they had values. And uh, my theory is uh, they've lost face in, in most, of, most other institutions. So they don't have the universities anymore. They're out of school. They don't go to church anymore. They don't believe in government anymore. The one purpose that they do get is from their company. They want you to take a stand. So these CEOs didn't have much choice because employees can work somewhere else, especially in tech, they have choices. And so they were pushed into this, but now that they're there, they're trying to figure it out. I get calls literally every week of, of uh, CEOs who are struggling. What should I say? What I shouldn't say? Uh, myself and Ken Frazier and Ken Chenault were asked to speak to the business council, which is the top 200 you know, kind of CEOs in the country. That was the main question. Can you guys come on and talk about kind of how can we make a difference? And so what we did was focus them on jobs. So like you guys can't really solve police injustice, a lot of other things that you don't know anything about, but you can hire people. So we got them to commit to hiring 1 million black people over the next 10 years. And they, uh, the project's called 110 and they committed to putting $100 million a year into that over the next 10 years. And so that's something tangible they could do. We could hold them accountable for. You need to hire the people or you're dead. You put the money in or you're dead. And so we're trying to find ways to hold people accountable and say, if you're really committed and you're doing this and you mean what you say, show me by hiring some black people. I mean, that's a great answer. I mean, uh, Ben, you and I, um, do this work on the ground. You, you're slightly older than I, so you've been doing it a little bit longer. Uh, you're, you're the same age. Come on. <laughs> you've been doing it a little bit. Ben shows you the black don't crack. You've been doing it a little bit longer than I. But, <laughs> but one of the things, Ben, that we oftentimes find ourselves um, talking about, I think that uh, one of the most unique conversations I've ever had was uh, with you, uh, Harry Daniels, and myself on the way to the funeral for, for Andrew Brown. And you talked about that feeling how you just never get used to that feeling of going to another funeral. How do we break this cycle? It's been a year, but how do we break this cycle of the perpetual state of, of grieving? And the, let me just, let me give you this illustration, Ben. Um, it, we have not had any political change in this country that was absent black blood flowing in the street. You wouldn't have had the Voting Rights Act or the Civil Rights Act without the 1960s, Evan Pettus Bridge, et cetera. You wouldn't have had the Fair Housing Act of 68 without the assassination of King. You don't have the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act without the death of George Floyd. How do we make that progress and get corporations to help us push for that progress without us having to pay what Abraham Lincoln called the last full measure of devotion? Man, I, I channeled Don Lemon or Anderson Cooper with that question. That was a good one right there, Ben. Let's see if you can flesh that out for me a little bit. <laughs> that was Laird, Bakar. Everybody else had a simple question. Uh, but no, it is good to have this conversation, especially with these uh, corporate titans, because I do believe when we think about Bakar, what has changed in the last year, but more importantly, what you asked, how do we prevent this from continuing to happen? Seem like every week. I mean, it's hashtag at the hashtag of black people being killed unjustly by the police who are supposed to protect and serve them. And what I believe is we have to increase the value of black life point blank period. Whether that is in these uh, 
police excessive use of force cases, or whether that's in corporate America, or whether that's in our communities that represent growth for corporations and doing business there underserved now, we have to use moments like George Floyd where America is finally ready because as you and I have often taught to have this racial reckoning uh, that they have long ignored. They just always would shy away from the conversation where it was very difficult to look away from the George Floyd video. Now, we're talking about it to Jerry Charles and Tara's point, but the question is, will we act? You know, it's one thing to talk the talk, but will you do something about it? We haven't had meaningful police reform in America in 57 years. And I am so concerned, and God knows you know this, Bakar, your two home senators is the key to making this uh, George Floyd Justice Act finally pass with some substance and not be just rhetoric, but can actually prevent us seeing another Breonna Taylor or another Jacob Blake Jr. or where Jerry lives, Corey Jones, where Charles lives, or uh, Eric Gardner, where Terry is uh, near her, Daniel Prude in Rochester. So everywhere in America, you see these killings keep happening. And this is after George Floyd. And so have we made progress? Absolutely. Do we have a long way to go? Absolutely. But the only way we can prevent them is we got to have not just us, but our white brothers and sisters, not just the civil rights leaders, but the corporate leaders. We all have to act, y'all. We have to act. If we lose this moment, we may never get another moment like this for another half a century. And the last thing I will say on this question, Bakari, is, and I know I'm preaching to a different audience, but we have to look and be intentional to have these conversations in rooms that they don't often mm -hmm. like to talk about this stuff. I know when I, I'm asked about George Floyd, I try to be very honest. I say every black person in America who looks at that video, we say, but by the grace of God, that could be my brother, my father, my husband, me. Our white brothers and sisters look at the video and they say, oh my God, how can a person do that to another human being? But they never, ever think that could be them. And that's why. Ron and Mr. Vard, let me just be, you know, you, you guys deal with people either in your own companies or training, training them up uh, to be in these corporate suites. What do you say to people um, to answer Charles's question and how he went in front of that corporate council? But what do you say to individuals who come to you and say, one, should we be involved in social justice issues outside of just giving money? Um, and two, how do we actually implement concrete steps? What do you say to those individuals who want to get involved but want to know which way to go? Or do you want to, or? Just jump. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't think you have a choice. See, this is the issue. You know, we, when you think about the, the, the murder of George Floyd and all of the companies and CEOs that came out with their intention to either spend money or commit or hire, or invest, or improve, fill in the blank. There was a lot of that conversation. And so when you think about, all right, well, what happened to that? Because that's, you know, Ben talked about intention, you know, intention. Intention sometimes can show up as rhetoric because no CEO gets to keep their job when they intended to increase shareholder value, when they intended to increase EPS, where they intended to meet their earnings forecast. You don't get to stick around, but somehow you get to retain your job when year after year, quarter after quarter, your numbers don't improve when it comes to representation. And I'm not going to say of minorities, I'm going to say of, of Black professionals, of Black people in your organization. So I think that the conversation 
is now about, and, and I'll talk to you about, you know, individuals versus companies, but the accountability and the consequences. It's accountability and consequences. Who's measuring? Who's keeping? Who's asking the questions in the organization? Are we keeping our commitments or is it just hollow? And then, all right, if you're accountable for it, then what are the consequences when you don't perform? So I'm happy to say that, you know, two of the corporate boards that I serve on, that there are consequences, that it is baked into incentive, it is baked into your pay, it is baked into your performance and evaluation, your achievement of goals of representation. When you don't have accountability and consequences, then over and over the same thing happens. And I also think too that the, the change that we have to make, some of it is evolutionary, but a lot of it is revolutionary. A lot of it has to change because what you're doing is not working. And we all know the definition of doing the same thing and expecting a different result. So I ask the questions in the boardroom that get us to examine where we are and what we need to do. As an executive, the thing that I did was when I walked into the boardroom as an operating executive, I knew that I wasn't just representing myself, but there were a lot of people outside the door that I had to speak up, I had to speak for and about. And those conversations are very, very uncomfortable, but you have to have them. And I, I would say that more companies are having those conversations led by people that don't necessarily look like me because the expectation is, well, of course, you're going to talk about that. But allyship is important, but you also have to respect you have to take the responsibility to say, I am going to ask the, the question. I'm going to lean into the discomfort of it. And I'm also going to be around to say that you haven't held up to what you said you were going to do. Ms. John? I think employees are watching, our customers are watching, our partners are watching. So I don't think there is any way that an organization uh, that, or the leaders within the organization can, can stand back. And if there's no, it's not good enough to just be an ally without putting your personal reputation behind it and showing your commitment to driving this. I think it is a challenge and we're having, you ha we're having those conversations that didn't take place in the past because people are tired and they're hurt and they're not seeing movement from their, from their company to align to their personal values. And uh, they're walking away. We've seen uh, increase in resignations as people are not seeing that their companies align to their personal values or aligning to their purpose. And so companies are being dissected for the words that they're using, dissected by the commitments uh, that they're putting out there. And not only are they being tracked internally, but they're being tracked by the market, to your point, in terms of um, how they're tracking their, their quarterly results, just like they could track what their customers are saying. And so there's no longer an option to step away and, and, and say you're not going to do anything. It's too risky not to. And, uh, and it, it's at the expense of the employees and the communities in which we operate. Mr. Phillips, one of your unique roles is, is uh, you have, uh, amongst a number of them is with the BEA. And you guys have created some unique partnerships with Bank of America, with Wells Fargo. Uh, with the greatest HBCU in the country known as Morehouse College. Um, I always have to throw that plug out there for my, my uh, alma mater. Um, but talk about the evolution of those partnerships. Is this something new that you're beginning to see more where you're creating these entrepreneurship funds? Um, that's the first part of the question. And the second part is something that you mentioned, which is accountability. Are you seeing, and I think that Ms. DeVard actually brought it up earlier, but are you seeing these dollars and that a change in behavior throughout the pipeline? Are you seeing uh, procurement spend? Are you seeing individual corporations, excuse me, actually doing the things that they said they were gonna do a year ago? Because it has been a year. And so the question is, where are we now? I mean, ha has this actually been coming to fruition? Yeah, good question. Uh, so the Black Economic Alliance, uh, which I'm co-chair of, was founded by about 70 business executives. And the reason we did that, Black business executives, was to take some of our training we run in business and see how we can apply that in black community to create jobs and wealth and wages. And, uh, and what we found out over time is a lot of businesses just do not understand what to do next. Even if they wanted to help, they don't understand what are best practices. They haven't focused on this problem. Businesses have a trouble executing on anything if this isn't a playbook and if you can't measure it, that's how they're used to running their business. So part of what we're trying to do is give them those playbooks. Here's something you can do. Here's how you measure yourself. You have to have transparency, just like anything in your business. If you're not publishing things and holding yourself accountable, nothing's going to happen. And so we've been pushing them for things like, uh, for instance, one example we gave them was uh, for ISS, which is Institutional Shareholder Services. They tell people how to vote on proxies. 
you know, basically, do I want to replace this board of directors or not? And for years, they've been saying, vote against any board of directors if they don't have enough women on them. They've never done that for Black people. So we're giving them ideas like that. It's like, you've understood what you did for women. Do this for Black people. Uh, so I do think people are kind of groping and trying to find out how to do this better. On the Center for Black Entrepreneurship, that was a project that started with some VCs that called me. This was again, right after George Floyd, about 20 VCs in California said, you know, we'd love to help black people, but we don't see any black entrepreneurs. There's no pipeline. It's not like we don't want to work with you guys, but we can't create entrepreneurs out of thin air. They just don't exist. And my response was, these are guys I've known for years. I go, that's what you do for a living. You build entrepreneurs. <laughs> that's your VC, your venture capitalist. So you just happen to be around white kids and not black kids. So you take these young kids, you teach them how to build networks, how to recruit people, how to build a product, all this, all the stuff you do on business building, you could do that with black people. They have ideas, they have attitudes, they just don't have access to you and capital. And so the idea was to get these VCs who are normally in California to set up shop on the campus of Morehouse and Spelman. And so fast forward six months later, we've raised $50 million for the project to hire faculty and tenured professors and another $50 million in a fund to invest in the ideas that the kids come up with. So we're starting with Morehouse and Spelman. We're gonna add other HBCUs over time and eventually online so you don't have to be a student. Uh, but the idea is let's take people who know how to build businesses, put them around black people who have great ideas, who know their communities and want to build a business. They just don't have access. So we're working on that right now. Thank you for all your efforts so far and everything that you will be doing. That's innovative. And I think that that's the type of things we, we need to be done to build this pipeline and create um, create wealth. Because one of the things that we we have to do a, more, a better job of in our own communities is how do we create wealth? Um, ben, you get invited to speak to uh, these corporations a lot now in these large groups right now. What are you telling? Um, what are you telling these CEOs? What are you telling these corporations about how they can get involved and what they need to do beyond just you know writing a check for hundred thousand dollars to you know the NAACP legal, legal Defense Fund? Now that's great. Now we we'll, we'll take the money, but what more? And what are you telling these individuals? Uh, thank you, Bakar. And I, I want to say uh, thank you to what Charles and uh, others did with the BEA in Georgia, when they uh, said that based on you trying to suppress the votes in our community, we're gonna take an affirmative action. And I think that's what I try to tell these corporations who invite me because I, I'm very honest because I'm, I'm Ben Crump, whether I'm on TV or whether we talking on the phone, uh, we believe, uh, completely what we say, we're unapologetic in our defense of uh, black life and black liberty and black humanity. And so when you get a chance to speak truth to power, I always believe you have to do it. Now I'm not doing it to try to be antagonistic to them, but shame on me if I get the opportunity to speak to them and I don't tell the truth about the fact that, and, and Butch Graves helped me with this a lot too. We have to say things about, uh, you know, you talk about financial literacy for our community. Well, black people can read and write and learn just as good as anybody else. What we need is financial empowerment. You need to give us access to capital. Uh, you need to do for us what you do for the white community. We don't need a, a handout. All we need is a hand up. And once we get up, we can do just fine. You know, and that's what we have to continue to say over and over again. And the other thing I always say to go back to that point I made about George Floyd, they just, and I think everybody on the panel said it, they have no idea, Bakari, our reality. They just don't understand it. I'll, I'll say this, this one little thing, and it gets deep um, when we have these fireside chats. I say in states like Florida, Tennessee, and Texas, one out of every five black men are labeled as convicted felons. And the experts opine if this trend continues in the next 25 years, one out of every three black men will be labeled as a convicted felon. 
and many of the states are just like these three states. And I say, I want you to try to imagine for me, if you would, that you are a parent of a black male child and that you are a, uh, have a black male nephew and you have a black male cousin and you try to imagine them around the age of five, six or seven years old. And in your mind's eye, you try to imagine them playing as children often do. And just try to imagine in your mind as you observe them, which one of these three little black boys with your blood running through their veins in the next 10 to 20 years will be labeled a convicted felon and live a permanent underclass uh, citizen in America. And you try to have that stark reality and say a lot of your African-American employees have family members. It doesn't matter how talented they are, how resourceful they are. There's a system in America that will target them and try to label them as having no redeeming qualities for society, having nothing to contribute. And so you have to acknowledge that this is not just an issue for that community, but it affects your business as well in the long run. So let's figure out how to make America be America for everybody so it can help your corporation grow too. And don't tell me that you don't look at these issues and say, we can't do anything about it. Because the reality is you can. The question is, will you? And those are the kind of conversations we have. I'm thankful. I thought you were going to say you want to figure out how to make America great again. I didn't know what you <laughs> would that been. I'm glad you glad you veered off. Thank you one more question, Ben, before I go to uh, Ms. DeVard. I want to talk to her about corporate board diversity and if we've seen any, if we're beginning to see some of that. But Ben, you, you're focused uh, a lot on the policy of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. I would be remiss with all of these people watching if you didn't tell them a little bit about what that does. And then are you seeing any corporations like you did in Georgia with voting rights? Are you seeing corporations behind you helping to push the passage of that piece of legislation? Now, that's an excellent question, Bakari. And Bakari and I, I mean, we talked late at night, early in the morning, because you have to understand this uh, legislation is very impactful on many levels. But when you think about how much money goes into policing in America, and even more, how much money goes into criminal justice in America, you know, every move is calculated. Nothing happens by happenstance. They may get emotional, but then they start thinking about the bottom line and they start saying, well, you know, if we, we start limiting the police and what they can do, it stops this school to prison pipeline, this prison industrial complex. And so we have to literally, because as uh, we talk so often, we have to try to have them expand their thinking to reimagine a better world where black and brown people not being in the system is actually beneficial to them making money, to their corporate aspirations. And so with the George Floyd Justice and Police Act, uh, just to run down on what it really is, it's about holding police officers accountable. And it's not taken away uh, from their rights to go to court. But all we're saying is we want the families of those black people who we believe have been killed unjustly to have their day in court too. And that's that whole qualified immunity thing where over 95% of the cases when they kill black people are dismissed automatically. And people will say, well, how can it be? It's the intellectual justification of discrimination. And it not only happens in the courtrooms, it happens in corporations every day. It happens in every aspect of society. It happens on Wall Street, Charles. They come up with technical reasons to justify the discrimination because the worst thing they ever want to be acknowledged because is as a racist. They will dance all around it. They say it's not because they were black. They come up with other reasons. It's because, oh, that community there, we don't think that people can afford our products. You know, they come up with all these 
technical reasons. And we have to keep telling them that, no, no, look at the black dollar, how it spends. And then the finisher point, uh, Breonna Taylor, uh, no, not warrant uh, act is in the George Floyd where they can't just bust them black people doors, violating the fourth amendment to the constitution. Um, obviously dealing with the body camera videos, the only difference between Rodney King 30 years ago and George Floyd is the improvement in the quality of technology. You know, that's it. And so we want those officers to have to turn on their body cameras when they have interactions with us. And that's good, I think, in the tech industry, Charles, because it opens up an entire new stream of revenue. They all got to have body cameras. Then they all got to store those videos somewhere. They got to be able to get them for court and for administrative proceedings. I mean, it's a whole tech industry that comes from just this here. So I think that's how we win, Bacard, on making this happen and getting help from our corporate allies. And it has been happening. A lot of people in the Silicon Valley have been pushing hard for George Floyd. And I don't know, Bacard Sellers, if it's because they care so much about uh, George Floyd and others who look like George Floyd, but they see the financial uh, money to be made yeah. from making these laws. Hopefully I answered your question. I'll try to do it short, Bacar. Yeah, I know, Deacon, Deacon Crump. Well, I know, I know. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Sorry, Ms. if I may, I just want yeah, to pick sure. up on something he said because the case of making this uh, kind of a business case for people to do this is actually something smart to do. So that was one of the arguments we used <laughs> when we got these companies to sign up for hiring a million black people, the first thing we told them is like, these are your future customers. You want them to have money. You want them to have disposable income. You want them buying homes. So whether you like it or not, the demographics are changing. You want them in a position to buy your products. And then secondly, these are your future employees. So you're gonna to need to invest. You might as well wake up now and start doing this. And then lastly, we told them, look at what's happening. You know, the demographics are changing. The population is aging. Immigration is constrained by what Trump did. We still haven't fixed that yet. You have to train the people who are here. And who are those? They're going to increasingly be people of color. Accept that. And like from a business perspective, it makes sense to make this investment. And the last point we told them, like, you guys are all complaining about, you know, welfare and entitlements and taxes, the things the government spends. Guess what? If everybody has jobs and they're working and owning their homes, they consume a lot less entitlement spending. So you can fix it. Any way you look at it, this is good for you. Um, ben, you, you deal in a lot of, I think that people don't know the work that you do day in and day out. People just a lot of times see you um, where you have to stand with and lift up families after they've lost a loved one. But you also handle some large scale discrimination cases. You handle some environmental injustice cases. Many people don't know that Ben was one of the lead attorneys in the Flint water crisis, and they are still going out um, and seeking justice from certain entities. So uh, talk about from your perch, uh, what you've been seeing and, and have you been seeing a rise in these discrimination cases when individuals come to talk to you about corporate culture? What do you tell them about? I mean, because you, you're you are in you're in the weeds. And so so talk about what are some of the things that you're seeing and some of the things that you're telling them as well. Uh, to stave off having uh, Ben Crump sign the back page of an 18-page complaint against their company or corporation. Now, um, Picard, that is one of the things that we don't talk about enough uh, as, as Black executives, too, uh, about this rampant discrimination that we see happening at the lower and middle management, I would say. But after the last administration, I have never got as many calls as we've gotten from uh, black executives saying that they were passed over for promotions or that they were uh, not given bonuses and all types of things because I think the last administration uh, made it in vogue to say things that you probably were taught not to say, uh, but you just felt emboldened to do them. And, and I'll say this, because it was very interesting talking to some of these individuals who were at the tables when other uh, marginalized people of color 
were alleging discrimination and they didn't do anything to help them. And it's so ironic that now the tables turn and they were the ones facing the, the microaggressions. And so we have saw us bringing claims against many banks in America. And the reason why we're able to do these things now is those executives that were being discriminated against are now sharing with us where the body, bodies are buried. And so now we're having conversations with them where we know what's going on, how you continue to figure out how to deny us access to capital, to deny us uh, promotions and so forth. And it's very important that it we don't wait until it happens to you. When you see it happening, to another person of color, you should say something. Either, if you don't use the influence that you have, I think it's like Harry Belafonte told Trayvon Martin, Paris and I at the NAACP Image Awards. What good is it having influence if you don't use it when it matters most? I mean, you got the influence and you sitting up there looking at it and you don't say anything. Well, shame on you because God blessed you for a reason to be in these positions and you have to do something with those blessings to help others. And the second thing with these class actions and such, what we're seeing now more than ever, maybe it's because of George Floyd and this racial reckoning, uh, where this litigation with these environmental racism cases where you have all these uh, chemical companies and different corporations, they are talking to us about things that President Obama tried so hard to get them to do, to look at different ways, even though it's cheap land in the minority communities, but how do we have it where we can try to be good corporate neighbors, since we're going to be in these uh, minority communities that often don't have a voice, what can we do not to completely take advantage of them? And the conversations have to start with people like we have here, people who will watch Black Enterprise, because if we don't say it, it won't be said in the world. And I mean, there's a Flint Bacar in every state in mm -hmm. America. There is the talcum powder litigation. Y'all, that affects Black and Hispanic women more than anybody else. And it was intentional. And so we have to speak truth to power when you have these corporations who intentionally preyed on us because they said, no, we don't matter. Nobody cares. Well, if we don't care about Black lives, then who's going to care? And we can't just get upset when it's the police shooting us. It has to be when the corporations are killing us too. And we sit idly by and we don't say a word. And when I talk to these corporations, I always try to be friendly, Charles and Jerry and Tara. But my Lord, we always have a real conversation because I was taught by Professor Naeem Akbar at Florida State University, a great African-American psychologist. He said, if you sit down with your oppressor and you all walk out and it doesn't feel somewhat uncomfortable, then you weren't actually being honest, were you? Think about that. Man, you dropping nuggets from the Image Awards, from college sociology class. How we go? You want to go after him, Miss John? That's where I was going next. <laughs> but look, you know, in your corporation. One of the things that I that I pulled up is that you have three pillars of your DEI, and this this ties directly in with what Mr. Crump and Ben was just talking about. That is talent, culture, and communities. And so I want to ask you quite specifically some of the things over the past year where you, you can, black employees sometimes, especially after watching George Floyd, like they come to work and they just don't wanna deal with white folk today. Like, you know, you just, 
you have these moments and you, you just, you, the, the feeling is palpable. You see each other in the break room and you just like, you know, you, you just nod your head. What have you been doing when you talk about culture and communities internally to help your black employees, not just elevate them um, and not just survive? I think one of the things that we got to stop talking about in black communities to Miss DeVard's point is we got to stop talking about surviving. I mean, I, I, I know that comes from my mom and my grandmama's church but I want to start talking about thriving. How are you, how are you talking to your black employees and particularly in take, creating an internal culture where you can help them thrive in moments of intense and immense pressure with COVID and in light of George Floyd? So thanks, Bakari, great question. Uh, I think, and uh, I'm gonna build on something that both Charles and Jerry said er earlier. And one of the first things that we did is we gave our employees a space to have conversation. So from a culture perspective, we've been doing, hosting a lot of courageous conversations. We're, we're hosting days of understanding to give our employees the freedom to be authentic, to talk about um, how they're feeling and being open and having conversations that we likely haven't had across the organization in, in a number of years, if, if at all. And um, Manual Life has a global footprint. And so we've been doing that across every market in which we operate. And so we felt it obviously very uniquely across the US, but it was felt across Canada. And I could say that personally, um, the experiences that I had and, and what I, I shared with colleagues and, and across Asia too. And so we're allowing our employees and our leaders to get underneath and not just stay at the superficial level and, the, and, the, and, and let's have some really heart to heart open conversations. And so there's been a significant investment on top of um, the days of understanding and the, the deep conversations that we're having to develop uh, learning programs to support all leaders to have better awareness as they think about DEI and what does that mean to them as leaders and how they need to create space and uh, for their employees, particularly their black employees. We've, all, we've also been doing and opening uh, learning more broadly across the organization. And so we know that it's a journey. We know that we need to create the climate for employees to feel comfortable. And so this is not a one and done. So we've, we've made, um, like many companies, we announced our financial commitment and that's tied to, as you mentioned, our talent, culture and community. And on the community side, we have done um, sign significant investments, but to your point, it's not about writing a check. It is about writing a check to what end to drive outcomes and what are the organizations that we know that we can have a significant impact and that will drive and, and is in alignment with the goals that we've achieved and so, uh, that we've set for ourselves that definitely not have achieved yet. Um, so if I think about, uh, we're a signatory across for Black North, which exists in Canada to raise the representation of Blacks and senior and people of color and senior level roles across all organizations on, on boards. We're a signatory for the CEO action for uh, diversity and inclusion across the US. And so it aligns to the public commitments that we've been making. And we're also spending time, again, from a community perspective at looking at our supplier governance process. And I know you talked about this earlier, Charles talked about this earlier. How do we think about the partners um, and have conversation with our vendors and get underneath what are they actually doing specifically as it relates to DEI? And asking those difficult questions to make sure that what they're driving aligns to where our commitments that, we've, uh, that we're making and thinking about if they can't articulate it, are they businesses that we wanna to continue to partner with in the future? But our, I would say on a whole, our employees um, are feeling more open and more comfortable to have the conversation, but they know it's not enough. They wanna see the movement, they wanna see the representation, they wanna see people that look like them at senior levels of the organization. And so we're being way more transparent in terms of what our goals are and what our representation would be at various levels across the organization to support um, the conversations that we're having and show some of the proof points. I also wanted to say it, there is power in the question and we have more power than we use. And a lot of then what you were talking about earlier is I think is fear driven. People don't speak up because there is fear and, and fear of what's gonna happen to me and what's in it for me. And I also think too, when you think about, I always say there should be a, a 12 step program you know, for, for, you know, racial reckoning, you know, it's from the first step is acknowledgement, the 12th step is reparations, but, you know, there's a lot in the middle of that before you get there. And, but also too, I don't want to minimize this idea of, of just writing a check. Writing a check is important. 
right? I mean, Black Enterprise needs advertisers because Black Enterprise is putting the message out there, sponsoring things like this with, you know, the ELC and other organizations to get to get all of you, you know, all of your points of view out there and heard. And so you need under organizations to understand that, yes, they have to, you know, have an acknowledgement of what the issue is, be committed to making a change, being very honest with themselves. That's what I talked about, those diversity audits. What is our representation? What is it at every level? What is it by gender? Don't just talk about minorities, break that out and talk about black and Hispanic and, you know, and women and Asian. And so I think all of that has a place, but also writing a check allows organizations, charitable organizations, um, to really mobilize people to create change because you're not going to be able to do that just by, you know, wanting to make it happen. I actually just want to say thank you all um, for the role that you all play. Um, Ms. Ms. John made me just think when she was talking about some of the things that they were doing about how the only reason, one of the real reasons outside of Darnella Frazier, who actually had the strength to carry the camera, but we also had black folk throughout the diaspora, around the world, who came out into the streets. And that's the real reason that we saw justice uh, for George Floyd. Uh, Darnella Fra it only took Darnella Frazier, a 17 year old black girl, and a worldwide unrest for us to get progress, but we will take it, okay? So in your last 30 seconds or so, 30 seconds, Ben. Um, it, it, George Floyd been tortured to death though. So on, on camera, I know. Uh, uh, your last 30 seconds, just give your observations over the last year and answer just this kind of small question of where do we go from here? And I'll start with you, Charles. So just by looking at my fellow panelists and you too, Bukhari, just the number of people stepping up and taking public positions, this didn't happen 15 years ago. Uh, I just think people uh, are more, for whatever reason, I have the courage now to jump out there at personal risk and say some things that maybe they wouldn't have said 15 years ago. So I'm very encouraged. I know we have all our issues and we're not where we want to be, but the progress and the fact that people are paying attention and more black people are speaking up, I'm optimistic that things will get better. So I just want to thank Ben and Jerry and Tara for all you're doing out there because I see it all and, and you guys are heroes to a lot of people. Mr. Vart. Uh, I, I can't say it any better than what Charles said. I mean, it's, I, I started off by saying that I felt that we've made progress. I'm hopeful. I have no other way to be but hopeful because if I'm not hopeful, then I believe that nothing can change. But I think that old adage, if not me, who, if not now, when, um, still exists. And we need to be able to hold ourselves accountable for making our little small dent into the universe of creating change for diversity and representation. Ms. John? I would agree. The only thing I would add is I too am hopeful, so you're not going to get an argument from me, Jerry. <laughs> but um, with respect to um, Black people being comfortable and having their voice and not and having their voice at work and in public places, but also uh, I feel hopeful that our allies are truly stepping up and and doing more than just than just talking. They realize um, that they're committed and they're part of this change. And Mr. Crump. Bakar, I just want to thank you for a, a very engaging panel. Yes, yes. You were brilliant as always, brother. Um, and, and I think we should absolutely use this moment to continue to have these conversations. Some people will call them uncomfortable conversations, but we should always articulate it as an important conversation. Nobody wants to do anything uncomfortable but everybody wants to do something important. And so we have these important conversations to talk about all of our children having an equal opportunity at life and liberty in the pursuit of happiness. And Bakari, that's always the most important thing, the pursuit of happiness when we talk about corporate America because that leads us into business. Isn't that what the pursuit of happiness has always been for Americans to have this opportunity to achieve the American dream. So I, I thank Black Enterprise. I always learn from Charles and Jerry, Tara, so nice meeting you. Charles, I can never say thank you enough for coming to Minneapolis, brother.
Yeah, we came out there, by the way, some business people, uh, myself, Raymond Guarn, and uh, Al Sharpton went out for the trial, and Ben was gracious and hosted us, and we just wanted to show solidarity that business and political people and lawyers, we can all come together in the Black community. You know, I, I knew that occurred, and I didn't want to mention it unless you, you two mentioned it. I was, <laughs> I was going to throw that out there, but I think that, you know, a lot of the work that you all do and a lot of the work that Black execs do, um, we always ask for more, 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 but a lot of times we don't know the, the, the bigness to make up a word of your heart and your efforts behind the, beyond, behind the scenes. And we know uh, some of those things have been done. So thank you. Everybody joining us today is joining us not because we believe anything about this country is irredeemable. In fact, we just want to reimagine what she looks like um, and reimagine a country uh, that is safe for all of our children so they can grow up. And as Ben says, that they can have not just the pursuit of happiness, but life, liberty, justice, peace, all those words that may not be so tangible, but we want young black children particularly to be able to grasp onto those things as well. I'm from the big city of Denmark, South Carolina. My mom and dad would always tell me the three most important words in the English language are the words thank you and they're not nearly said enough. And thank you to all my panelists tonight. Thank you most importantly to Black Enterprise for bringing this uh, August collection of individuals together. Please support Black Enterprise y'all. Uh, we need it here. We need it to survive. Um, like the old gospel song says. And so thank you for everyone. Special thank you to our producers tonight, Genevieve Bryant, Ken Meeks, Derek Dingle, and everybody who worked very hard to make sure that we would be comfortable and put on a great town hall series. Look for the next episode of the Black Enterprise Town Hall Series. My name is Bakari Sellers. And again, thank you for joining us today.